Welcome. I'm so glad you guys joined us today for worship and for the word. Hey, just want to let you know that we're here for you as you journey along your journey with Jesus. Uh, if you have any questions about your walk with God, just text us any question you have and we promise we'll respond to you. By the way, we've given you a subscription to Right Now Media, every household. It's yours for free. I was astonished this week and I looked under the section for men and I found a really good resource for men. It's called 33. You might want to check it out. It teaches us how to, how to be warriors and kings and lovers and friends. If you've not yet enacted your Right Now Media subscription, we'll send you the text where the link is right there. All right. The other thing is um, I'm also doing a daily devotional. And the way to get that daily devotional by video is on the app, the church app. And if you don't have the app yet, we'll just send that to you. All you have to do is text app, and we'll send that right to you right now today. Well, this week coming up, we have Tuesday night Bible study at 7 o'clock. All you have to do is go to the website, and just the link is right there every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. On Thursday night, every Thursday night at 8 o'clock, we have my Bible study. We're going through the seven deadly sins right now. It's really good stuff. All right, the big announcement is Mother's Day. We're going to be outdoors. We're going to invite you to the outdoor service on May 9th on Mother's Day. We're going to hang out, bring your mask, we'll set chairs out for you. We'll have some fellowship and fun together. I want to thank you again for your tithes and offerings during this season. Again, go right to the website, and we'll give the opportunity there to either give by Zelle or PayPal. All right, God bless you guys. Have a tremendous week.
welcome. It is an honor and a privilege to have you, whether you've been coming here or this is your first time. Welcome. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that this is the day that you have made, that we will rejoice in it and be glad. That no matter what our week looked like, no matter what we went through, the obstacles that were um, in our paths, Lord, we thank you that you carried us. You gave us the grace to make it through each day. You gave us the strength that we needed for each day. We thank you for being our good shepherd. That no matter what happens, Lord, you are always the source that refreshes us, that renews us, that reminds us again to keep pressing in. So, Lord, as we get ourselves ready for worship, as we get ourselves ready to praise you, Lord, may we remind our souls that no matter how we're feeling, no matter what's going on, um, that we don't follow our, our hearts in that way, we don't follow our feelings that way, but we follow your word that tells us to rejoice always, to give thanks in everything. And so that is what we want to do today. We pray all these things in your name, Lord. In Jesus, amen. our cornerstone in him we safely rest his love unbreakable we build our faith on jesus your name and that alone it's been our firm foundation our courage is your throne we will not be shaken we will not be moved we will stand on the rock of our salvation we will not be shaken we will not be moved trust in the God of our salvation. Say we will not, we will not be saved. No, no. We will not be moved. We will stand on the rock of our salvation. safely rest his love unbreakable we build our faith on jesus your name and that alone it's been our firm foundation our courage is your throne i know you'll never fail me on you i can depend i know your plan is perfect i'm glad you call me friend Shaken, we will not be moved. We will trust in the God of our salvation. We will not, we will not be shaken. We will not be moved. We will 
will stand on the rock of our salvation. We will not be shaken, we will not be moved, we will trust in the God of our salvation. Just our voices, we will not, we will not be shaken, we will not be moved, we will stand on the rock of our salvation. We will not be shaken, we will not be moved, we will trust in the God of our salvation. Because he's a strong God, he's mighty, and we can hide. A strong God, and He's mighty. mighty. Yes. And I'll forever hide in You. He's a strong God, strong God. and He's mighty. mighty. The name of the Lord is our strong tower. We can hide in Him. He's strong God, strong God. and He's mighty. mighty. Oh. And I'll forever hide in. He's a strong God, strong God. He's mighty, mighty. And I'll forever hide in you. He's a strong God, strong God. He's mighty, mighty. Yes. And I'll forever hide in you. We will not be shaken. We will not be moved. We will stand on the rock. Salvation. No, we will not be shaken. We will not be moved. We will trust in the God of our salvation. Yes, yes. We trust in you. a strong tower the righteous run in and we are saviors I believe you are the way the truth Through every promise, through every 
Cause they can't stay long When I'm here with you All my fears and doubts They can all come true Because they can't stay long When I'm here with you If the altar's where you need us Take me there, take me there If what you need is just an offering It's right here, my life is here And I'll be a living sacrifice for you You're a fire a refiner I want to be consumed if the altar's where you need us take me there take me there if what you need is just an offering it's right here my life is here and I'll be a living sacrifice you're a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire. You refine. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by fire. Your glory wants to come in. Let it fall. We want it all. Your fire is consuming. Fill this place. Set it ablaze. And I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire, the refiner. I want to be tried by fire Purified You take whatever you desire Lord, here's my life I want to be tried by fire Purified You take whatever you desire Lord, here's my life. If your glory wants to come in, yes, let it fall. We want it all. Your fire is consuming. Fill this place, set it ablaze, and I'll be your living sacrifice.
I keep hearing over and over the lyrics for new wine. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender. Some of us are in that place of being in the crushing and in the pressing and in the fire. But we have yet to recognize that what Jesus is doing is bringing new wine and he's refining. So I would encourage you to press into the discomfort, to press into the trial, to press into the circumstance and allow yourself to be crushed as Jesus was crushed so that the Lord can bring new wine. No, it won't be comfortable. No, it won't be fun, but it will be worth it. So Lord, clean our hands, purify our hearts. We want to burn for you, Lord, only for you. If the altar is where you need us, then that's where we'll be, Lord. If the altar is where you need us, that is is where we'll be. If what you need is just an offering, then Lord, here I am. Take my life as a sacrifice. You gave it to me, so the least I can do is give it back to you willingly. I wanna be tried by fire. 
I want my faith tested so that I can stand on the rock of my salvation knowing that I will not be shaken. I will not be moved by the midst of my circumstance. I want to burn for you, God, only, only for you because I believe you are the way. I believe you are the truth and I believe you are the life. So I set myself before you as a willing sacrifice for you to do whatever pleases the Father, whatever pleases you, Lord God. And it doesn't have to make sense to me, Lord God. It doesn't need to make sense. I just need to be willing, available, and to show up and for you to do whatever it is that pleases you. So Father, I pray today we would find ourselves in that place as willing sacrifices, laying down all that we are so that you can show up as all that you are and your magnificent glory can be seen through our lives. Fill this place, Lord, set it ablaze. By this place, I mean this temple, this earthly vessel, the one that is not good enough to house your glory and yet and still you chose me. Fill this place, God. Set it ablaze, and we will be living sacrifices to you. God, you are faithful. You are good. You are kind. Your glory is unending. And forgive us, Lord, for the moments when we take our eyes off your glory and put them on our circumstance. Forgive us for the times when we get so caught up in our emotion that we forget that you are in total control. Purify us, God. Refine us with your fire and make us worthy vessels, worthy of you, worthy of your presence. Nothing we can do can ever get us there, but you've chosen us anyway. So we submit to the potter's hand. We submit to the wine press. We submit to your loving care, Lord God. I ask that you would prepare us for the word, like truly, truly prepare us for the word, Father. Because your word is alive, it's active, and it's more relevant today than it was before because the times we're in need you so desperately. May we never lose our passion for your power. And may we never lose our awe of your wonder. I ask these things, Lord. And again, I, I just, I press in and I ask for forgiveness for our laziness, for the running away, for all of the things that we do that's counter to your invitation. Forgive us, Father. And I thank you that you're continually drawing us. Have your way in Jesus' precious, holy, mighty, and all-powerful name, I pray. Amen. Good morning. This morning, I've entitled my message with you, uh, Living in Peace on the Mysterious Roadway. Uh, those could be two contradictory terms. We'll see. I want to start out with Psalms 46, verse 10, which says, Cease striving. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. That's uh, the New American Standard. The New Living Translation just simply says, Be still and know that I am God. So I'd like to ask you this morning, how much do we strive without even recognizing that we're striving. How often do we find ourselves in the midst of trying to figure things out? How comfortable are we with mystery, um, with the unknown? Well, I'm going to confess to you that me, not so much. I'm kind of a fixer, so if you present me with a problem, I'm taking care of it. Probably won't even stop to pray unless it's real big, but it would have to be real big because I'm a fixer. So I used to have a phone book that helped me fix a lot of things. Now I have Google, 
that helps me fix a lot of things. But I would just go for it, just go for it, and work and work and work and work and work until I had an answer. And then, I don't know, one day I realized that, number one, maybe it wasn't even within my pay grade to solve the problem. Number two, maybe the person I was helping didn't even want me to solve the problem. And number three, maybe I was wasting time when God would have had a different way. So about two years ago, a little over two years ago, God began taking me on a journey. And it actually started with um, the song that Tiffany referenced at the end of worship this morning. It started with um, the song New Wine. It started with In the Crushing, In the Pressing. And I, I knew that God was calling me to the place of the wine press. And he said, Sharon, I'm going to crush you. I'm going to break you. I am going to uh, squeeze you until new wine comes out of you. And I, honestly, I embraced that with great joy. I assumed it would be a little painful, uh, assumed it would be a little difficult, but the reward of new wine and new fire and new power, I was like, God, I'm all in. Well, if you had asked me two years ago if I would have thought that the crushing and the pressing would have contained some of the things that it's contained, or I would be today where I am, or I would have faced the things I've had to face, I would have told you, no, God would never do that to me. Well, surprise, <laughs> he did. He did. And I'm not where I thought I would be two years ago. I'm not where I thought this road would take me. It was a very mysterious and strange road, filled with the unknown, filled with the unexpected, filled with, what? This is happening? What? I have, what? And so the good news is I decided not to turn back or abandon the path that God had taken me on. But that came sometimes with great, um, great consternation because there are many times when I just wanted to go back to the same way that I was behaving before. But in the midst of this journey, God has given me this devotional. It's a two-volume devotional, and it's something that, that will probably stay with me for the rest of my life. I will probably do this devotional frontwards and backwards, backwards and frontwards, both volumes, till the, till the last day I'm on earth because the value that I find in it is so great. So the first, I, I'm going to actually read you some pages out of this journey that the Lord has taken me on, and I'm going to explain to you what I learned as the Lord spoke to me. The whole devotion is written as a man asking God questions and God answering him. That's the format. So when I'm talking to you, it's God answering the man the questions that the man asks. So the first devotional I want to read to you is this. It says, No one desires hunger, but some blessings cannot grace a full belly. Your weakness is drawn like a magnet to my strength. Your hunger seeks my provision. The one who needs little loves little, the one who gives. And the one in no danger thinks little of the refuge. Those sleek with rich eating are not always the blessed. A full belly is a poor substitute for oneness with the Lord of life. The man says, what am I to do, Lord? And the Lord answers, this day ponder your belly. If you are full, fast a bit, but remember the high one who sustains you. If you are hungry, know that yours is a harsher gift that is truly more gracious in the end. For I will call you nearer to me at my table than you yet dare to dream. So as I began to contemplate that, I thought, okay, hmm, hmm. Hmm. To be in need is not failure. But isn't that what the world tells us? That if you don't have, if you're in need, if you don't possess, your faith isn't strong, you're not working hard, you don't have good goals, whatever the world tells you personally, 
It makes it seem like to be in need or to be in want is failure. But the Lord began to show me that failure or need is only an opportunity for God to fill in the blank. You fill in the blank. And guess what? All the credit goes to Jesus. Do you know how much credit we take for things that really are not our responsibility at all? No. We need to develop this this wonderful mentality that nothing we possess is ours, but that everything we have is Jesus and everything that happens, good and negative in our life, belongs to him and the credit goes to Jesus. It's one of the ways that we fulfill the command to lift up Jesus and he'll draw all men unto him. When I take credit for myself, who do I draw men to? Oh, let me hang out with you. Let me learn some things from you. No, credit goes to Jesus. You hang out with me and I'll show you Jesus. Come hang out with me and I'll show you how I walk with God. And then you walk with God the way he calls you. It's a much better reality than taking the credit, any little tiny credit for yourself. So then I began to examine my heart because all of this caused me to say, like, where do I take credit? Where do I not give glory to Jesus when I should? Where, where, am, I not, uh, where am I not recognizing that my failure is a gift and an opportunity for Jesus? So I began to examine where was I as my own provider? Like, where, where was I in the fulfiller of my needs? So then we come to this devotion. You were made in my image, fashioned in your creator's likeness, with, all, with will, intellect, emotion, with relationship at your center, all made to know and to be known for the everlasting now. But now I wonder as I look at you, if you think I was made to look like you, rather than the reverse. I see you toss out truths that paint you poorly, changing your belief to sugared falsehoods, not changing your life. I fear that when you look at me, you long to see a mirror, to see your God's pickled face shaped just like your own. Do not make me in your image, child of Adam, lest my true face wither you when you see it. And then that got me to thinking about the holiness of God. And how if he says, hey, Sharon, this about your life isn't reflective of me, doesn't please me, what's my response? Is my response the standard? Well, God knows. He made me. He'll forgive me. Or is my response to fall on my face and say, Jesus, you made me. Forgive me. Change me. Draw me. See, leaving out the change me, draw me, that's a big part. Because will he forgive you? Absolutely. Did he make you? Yes, he did. Does he want you to stay in the influence of humanity and the world on your life? No, he does not. He wants to draw you above that. He wants you to be a cut above. If the world says this is okay, but God says it's not, then you have to say No, not okay for me, no matter what the world says. So then I started thinking about what would it look like to really, really rest in the knowledge of God? To really stop trying to be a good Christian, stop trying to work hard enough or fix things or provide or make people think that I was successful, even successful in the kingdom, even make people think that I was having a successful walk with God, what would it mean if I just left all that behind? And as I started contemplating that, lo and behold, I got to this devotional. I did not make this world to fill it with religion, but to fill it with life. I care so much less about rules than I do about whether you are rooted, whether you are growing, and whether you are bearing fruit. 
One apple at harvest time can look perfect on the outside, but inside be riddled with worms squirming in their excretions. Another apple can look mottled, ugly, and broken in the skin, but when you remove just a little of the peel, the flesh is ripe and healthy and wholesome. Which do you think pleases me more? And which do you think is good for nothing? Ripen in peace, sweet child of truth. Be fruit in keeping with the tree on which you grow. In all the gawking world, only my eyes matter. Only I look upon your heart. And then that got me to thinking, how much time we spend worrying about how we're appearing to other people, even when we think we're not worrying about how we appear to other people. You can ask uh, the guys who are here doing helping me with this recording, what was the last thing I said? How does my hair look? <laughs> right? How does my hair look? Is my sweater straight? Are all the lines going? Like, why? Because I care if you guys see me with ugly hair. Would my message be any less powerful with ugly hair? I think not. So even in the small, tiny things that, that, that escape our thought, we are concerned about the opinions of others, which is not necessarily wrong unless we're not as concerned about the opinion of the Lord. When I go into the presence of the Lord, when I... When I enter my time of silence and solitude and I sit before the Lord, you know I never think about if my hair looks good. It never crosses my mind. You know why? Because I've found acceptance there. I've not always found acceptance out here. See, so the lack of acceptance sometimes brings a worry about how we're presenting ourselves. We need to care so much less about out here and care far more about when the curtain closes and we're inside our own personal holy of holies, when we're inside our own personal tabernacle and we've come through the holy place and we've entered behind the veil and we're in the holy of holies and we're in the very presence of the Lord, can we stand? Can we stand? We should be able to stand. And then I got to this devotion. Why are you so slow to open your ears, but so quick on the trigger with your words? Why must all the world know your thoughts? Who was responsible for wisdom before you came along with your expertise? There is great power in patience, in measuring your words as sacred and mighty things. Listening is life. Do not reject it. The inner death comes slowly for an ear-plugged fool, entranced by his own words. But it will come eventually. Like creeping venom that poisons over years, not hours. And as it creeps through the blood of life, the poisoned ones harp on and on about how everyone else ought to live. I mourn those deaths long before the final shudder. And then all of a sudden in his presence, you realize that although you are your brother's keeper, you are not your brother's God. You are your brother's keeper in as much as you are to help him or her deepen their own relationship with God. Because remember one of the first devotions I, I read was that devotion is at, or that relationship is at our center. We're not here to tell other people how to live. We're not here to tell them where they're right or where they're wrong. We're there to introduce them to the Holy Spirit 
and to teach them to quiet their lips and open their ears. Because the Holy Spirit cannot tell me where I'm wrong if I'm telling everybody how I'm right. I have to be very slow with my words and very quick with my ears, specifically tuned to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because I cannot tell you how to live because you are not me. I remember having deep conflict over the fact that I didn't watch some movies. And I think that brought some kind of a, I don't know, if it was guilt or condemnation or conviction, because, you know, it's above my pay grade to know anyone's heart or even their mind. So I don't know why they were so stressed, because I didn't watch certain movies. But it certainly was a lively point of discussion on many occasions and they felt like I was telling them they couldn't watch those movies. I don't care what you watch. You know, if, if God says it's okay, then go for it. But because God told me no, I have to obey. I can't come to your house and watch a movie just to make you happy. I'm not going to do it because it violates my covenant with my father. So I've left the room on multiple occasions when things get you know, whatever, God tells me, Sharon, no, your eyes can't see this. It's not my job to tell you what to watch or what not to watch. It's my job to tell you or to help you or to model for you connecting with the Holy Spirit so he can tell you what you should or should not do. Way above my pay grade. And I've used holy, uh, <laughs> holy Q-tips even though they say you're not supposed to put anything smaller than your elbow in your ear, I have used holy Q-tips in my ears far more over the last two years than I ever have in my life. And 9.9 .9 times out of 10, I'm glad I did. And the point one that I'm not glad is because I haven't really thought about it yet. Because 10 out of 10 times, I'll be very glad that I waited for the Holy Spirit then spoke some kind of massive words of what I thought were wisdom. So then I thought, what, what would it really be like? This started me on this contemplative journey. What would it really be like to abandon all thoughts of what anybody else thought of me except Jesus? And I don't mean in the, you know, the classic, oh, I don't care what they think. Because when you say, I don't care what they think, you really care what they think. You're just trying not to, you know, most of the time. You're like, no, I'm, I'm really trying hard not to care what you think, but I'm bringing it up because I really, truly care what you think. So, you know, what I just started thinking, what would it mean to just only, only, the only face before me, what would it be like if the only face before me was his? And the only words that I allowed to seep into me would be his. And, and what, about just, what about just being that one with Jesus? So then I came to this devotion. This was the most amazing freeing devotion, I think. Uh, oh, no, I can't say that. That day it was the most freeing of the last two years, but then there was another day. So I can't say it, but I can tell you that this one has stuck with me deep, deep within my heart says this, nope, you will never be strong enough. Let me be your strength. Nope, you will never be smart enough. May I be your understanding? Nope, you'll never be wise enough, but my wisdom is here for you. To your lack, my abundance. To your sickness, my health. To your fears, my confidence. To your despair, my hope. To your pain, my comfort. To all your weakness, my grace, my sufficiency. To your limits, my infinity. To you, me. So that day, it was like, it was honestly... A lot of bad things happened the day I read this devotion, but it was like I floated on air 
throughout the entire day. That day I was faced with so many things that needed my decision, that needed, that needed experience beyond my years, that needed so much that I, that I was not aware that I would need to be prepared for or I would have been. It was such a day of, of the unexpected. But with each thing that came to me, each phone call, each circumstance, each person I had to encounter, it was like, ah, I don't have to be strong enough for this because I'm never going to be strong enough. So I can stop trying. I'm never going to be smart enough. I don't have to try to be smart. I'm never going to be wise enough. I don't have to be wise. I can just, I can just ask. I can just ask. And that day, my lack was his abundance. That day, my sickness was his health. That, that day, my um, fears were his confidence, and my despair was his hope. All that, all that was just an exchange. And because I read this devotion early, early, early in the morning, and then I lived out a very stressful day, it cemented it in my mind. And it cemented it in my, in my spirit, man, that I have worked my whole life to be good enough. I've worked my whole life to be smart, to be wise, to be healthy. I've worked my whole life to be things that are totally and completely outside of my grasp. So instead of being still and knowing that he was God, I just drove myself nuts and probably drove the people around me nuts on a, at least one or two times. You know, probably not more than that, but at least once or twice. How freeing is it to know? What great permission it is to know that you don't have to be smart enough. You don't have to be strong enough. You don't have to be wise. You don't have to be anything. All you have to do is know the one who is everything. And then connect yourself with him. So then that got to me to thinking about, but what about those people who hurt me? What about those people who are enemies of Christ? Okay, well, I don't really worry if they hurt me because they're enemies of Christ. Hmm, Sharon, what about the friends of Christ who hurt you? What about those who claim to be your brothers and sisters? What about those who claim to love you? What about when they hurt you? Is, is not being strong enough? Is not going to being wise enough? Is, is my hope going to be enough for the despair that you feel? Is my, is my health going to be enough for the sickness that comes on you when pain and despair overtake you? And then I got to this devotion. Arrows of war are made to come apart. So when the wounded pull the shaft from their flesh, the vicious head is left within. It will fester there, causing fever. It will be patient, hurting long after the skin above it has closed. With time, that which was not deadly may become deadly. That which seemed a shallow cut might still kill long after the archer has fled away. Anger is such an arrow, so hard to draw out fully, that those who try think it impossible. The wounded scratch the surface and swear at the pain which throbs and sharpens and frightens them. But once anger has lodged, the pride that is in all men keeps it there. The deeper the arrowhead creeps into the flesh, the more difficult becomes the patience and quietness that will draw it out. Such anger does nothing but kill. Ask me, I will heal your wounds. Hmm. Yes, pain inflicted intentionally or unintentionally does bring offense, which does produce an anger, which does fester and tries to kill. 
And the more we claw at it, the more we fuss with it, the more we scratch it, the more we recognize that it's there, the more we acknowledge it, the deeper it goes into our flesh. But patience and quietness draws it out. Patience and quietness, not worrying about it, not developing the scenario in your mind, but being still and knowing that I am God and walking in forgiveness. It's, the scripture says that no, no greater love than this, that one man would lay down his life for another. And I, I want to suggest to you that the greatest love that you can extend towards someone who has um, hurt you is to just lay down your life for them. Which means don't mess with the arrow they left there. Just don't mess with it. Don't worry about it. Don't try to get it out. Greater love than this has no man that he would lay down his life for another. Just let it go. Just let it go. In the devotion I read when it, it talked about my, for your lack, my abundance, God is everything that you need. You don't need, uh, you don't need people to tell you they're sorry. It's nice when they do. It's nice when people ask for forgiveness. But the best thing about forgiveness is you can extend it before it's extended to you. And quite honestly, that's laying down your life. It's laying down your life. It's not defending yourself. It's not, it's not expecting someone to acknowledge when they're wrong. It's just you resting in quietness and peace and patience and allowing God to draw the arrow out. And then you know what the good thing is? You don't die from the poison. You don't die from the poison. And then it also gives you pause to think about the arrows that you shoot and where you direct them and whether or not you want to shoot the arrow that is in your hand or whether you want to put it back in the quiver because it's not necessary. Well, honestly, freedom was beginning to be within my grasp. I was pretty darn excited. So then I got to the last two devotions I'm going to share with you. Well, next to the last devotions. Uh, actually, yeah. Okay. There is a value in what lasts. A diamond, for all its brilliance, would be no treasure if it crumbled like chalk between your fingers. Gold may be buried in the earth for centuries, yet shine as brilliantly as it did the day it was hidden. I never think about hiding, God hiding gold in the earth, but when you think about the process of mining, that's pretty cool. That's a whole other sermon. My word is timeless, rooted in a place beyond anything you can see, piercing up through the earth like an ancient seed warmed by a new sun, you can have this imperishable treasure if you are willing to trade what you think is your life. My, world, my word looks to all the world like garbage that blows about the streets. If you chase it, they will say you are a beggar or a madman. My word is only treasured by the meek who seem crushed but have found strange strength. Imagine the day when the world discovers the litter has always been diamonds and gold. Then they will see the meek as wise. Then they will envy the children in the trash heaps. Time crushes even diamonds, tarnishes even gold. Only my word lasts, for only my word is life. And when you learn to see it, you will find treasure everywhere. This deepened my love for the word. It's never that I didn't like the word, but my journaling tends to be more uh, connection with God in silence and solitude, and I love to journal. I love to write. 
And so sometimes I don't just pick up the Bible and read large portions of the word. This devotional made me understand that I'm missing a great, valuable, valuable tool in my tool bucket if I don't, if I don't honor the word, if I don't recognize the word for the treasure and the value that it is. And without the word, I can't keep my commitment to grow deeper, uh, you know, deeper roots and stronger branches. I, I can't keep that commitment. And so the last devotions that I'm going to read to you are these as I close. The great folly of humanity is not that you are naked. It is not that you know you are naked. It is not that you are ashamed you are naked and not that you are powerless to clothe yourselves. The great folly of humanity is nothing less and nothing more than this. You try so hard to hide from the one who loves you no matter what he sees. You try so hard to hide from the one who loves you no matter what he sees. Why do we run away when we should run toward? I don't know, but it's a question I hope that lingers with you long after this sermon. And the last is this. To be a baby is a wonderful thing, provided that one grows. In an, if an infant stays an infant as the years pass, something is wrong. Are you growing like Jesus? You must, you know, until you reach his full measure, one with the spirit, one with the body, feasting on the word at the table I lay in the presence of all my friends and all my enemies. Listen to this as I close. I love all, I feed all, I give to all, I call to all, desire all, know all. I offer you what you need, not only milk for today, but meat for 10,000 tomorrows. But I will not make you eat it. How sad it would be to get to heaven and to look back on our life and realize the table the Lord laid before us that we chose not to eat. I'm inviting you today in the words of Matthew 11, 28 and 29 to take his yoke upon you because it's easy and it's light. It's not burdensome. The table is spread before you. His abundance for your lack, his health for your sickness, all the things, all the little tiny gems that I read to you, his word blowing like trash through the streets, all of it is there for you. Will you pray with me as I close with the words of Psalm 23? This is something that I've memorized, and I, I say it to myself multiple times throughout the day. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. That's my mind, my will, and my emotions. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod for discipline and your staff for guidance, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Not something on the run as I'm being chased, but a table. You prepare a table before me where I can sit and eat in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all of the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
Amen. Thank you. I'd like to call Pastor Art to the, to the, up here to the table with me because today's communion, and I intentionally waited to take communion till the end because I wanted you to take communion with a new understanding. I wanted you to take communion from the point of weakness, all that stuff is positionally right where you should be so that you can exchange everything you are for everything he is. And when you take the bread, when you drink the wine, I want you to know that it is new life. It has been crushed. It has been pressed. It has been through the fire. It has been through the flood. And it has been provided through Christ's gift to us on the cross that this bread and this wine is for you. And the new life that he desires to give you right now, not in heaven, right now, today, May 2nd, 2021, right now, new life, new wine is waiting for you if you will eat it. Let's take the bread together. And now as we take the wine that has been crushed and pressed, Art and I are going to share one cup. Because although the journey is ours alone, we're not in it alone. If we will stand together, model for each other, hold each other's hand, lead each other to the throne of the Father, to the voice of the Spirit, and to the blessed, blessed hope of Jesus. Let's take the wine together. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for all that you are. Introduce yourselves to us in a brand new way. Draw us deeper. Give us deeper roots and stronger branches and help us remember that the faith we use to get to you is not about what we believe. It's about who we believe. Because the what can falter, but the who never can. In Jesus' name, amen. Living in peace in mysterious roadways. Um, clearly, the word we want to take away here is peace. Um, her opening, Pastor Sharon's opening, that really stuck out was, where is our comfort in the unknown? Um, or are we uncomfortable in the unknown? And we want to make sure that we're definitely comfortable with not knowing. Um, and kind of like depending on God, uh, so we are comfortable. Um, but the other line that really stuck out to me was, to be in need is not failure. It is only an opportunity to him to fill in the blank. One of the things that, I, I, that God was telling me uh, this past week that he kind of opened up in this sermon is, stop trying to be somebody because you are, you, you're already someone. And I feel like listening, basically listening to Pastor Sharon speak. If God already has purpose for you, he's going to fulfill it. Fulfill it. Um, you never lose value. Someone with a master's degree versus someone who drops out of high school, he values you the same way. And he works for the good of those who, who love him and that are called according to his purpose. And we all have that. And so our value never, ever changes. And we should find peace in that and stop trying to strive and be someone or impress anyone or trying to accomplish things. Growth is inevitable. We have to always grow, but we have to grow in him um, and, and the things that he has for us. And um, the question of the day, basically, she asked is, 
you know, why are we running from him or or why are we not drawing near to him? Do we have something that's trying to keep us from trying to enter into his presence? Because it, I, I guess we put it in a way where it's like we're not going on a date. We don't have to be prepared and set and perfect to enter into God's presence. He knows us inside out. He knows us with our good hair days or bad hair days, our flaws or our, you know, our good days without any flaws, but no one's perfect, so that person doesn't really exist. Um, he loves us as is. And so with the title of basically living in peace in our mysterious roadways, we can find peace that he loves us the way that we are. And he's basically prepared a table for us. Let's stop going out and trying to eat somewhere else and find out that we have all these allergic reactions of fear, anxiety, or worse, just walking away from him because we're not eating what he's already set for us. If you, if you give me the option of breakfast in bed, I'll take that all day. He has that prepared for us. And we need to stop striving to be you know, I guess someone that we're not or someone that he doesn't call us to be. We're putting too much pressure on ourselves. And that's definitely what I walked away with today. If any of you found the devotionals that I read from interesting and you would like to use them in your own journey with the Lord, all you need to do is text the number below the, uh, below on the screen and we'll send you that information. I cannot recommend them highly enough, but I also recognize that they're not for everyone's journey or maybe not for everyone's journey right now so please take advantage text we'll send you the information if you're interested thanks mm -hmm.